Okay, so I know. Um, yeah, we are trying to understand the Neumann algebras by using uh, free probability theory, in particular by using the fact that we can model uh, the free group factors uh, by, or yeah, we can model the free group factors by free semicirculars. And for semicirculars, we have very nice uh, random matrix models. Um, and in the following, we want to understand compressions of von Neumann algebras, and this means in particular that it will be uh, good to realize our generators or von Neumann algebra as matrices. And because the matrices compressions are clearer of what we have to do. And the random matrix picture of a semicircular gives us a, a good idea how we could represent a semicircle, let's say, as a 2x2 two two matrix. I mean, we can represent a semicircle, you can think of a semicircle as a big QE matrix, and if you want to write this as a 2x2 two two matrix, you, you cut this big matrix into blocks, and then we can understand what the blocks are. Okay, so let us look at this. And in particular, in this context, we will see that uh, complex versions of semicirculars, so called circulars, will play a prominent role. And actually, circulars are a special case of so-called other circulars. So I want to talk about those. And the crucial information will be to have a polar decomposition of a circular element. Oh, but this can be done in the context of other elements in the same way, and maybe this is even a better conceptual way of doing it. So I will also talk a little bit about other elements. Mark. What we want to do, so I said we want to realize, let's say, semicircle element as matrices. And for this, um, think of our semicircular element as the limit of n by n matrices. So let us consider the GE um, matrix, n by n matrix, A. So this was of the form 1 over the square root of n. And then entries AIJ, AIJ is running from 1 to 8. And the AIJ are part of the symmetry condition, independent Gaussian, complex Gaussians of variance 1. Okay, so in principle, if n is large, this is close to a semicircular element in distribution. Right? That's its weakness in this circle. Right? Good. But now we can take this big matrix and cut it into blocks by a 2 by 2 matrix. So actually we can consider this n by n matrix, let's say n is even, so we can then consider this as a 2 by 2 matrix, but where the entry, entries of this 2 by 2 matrix are itself matrices, huh? they are the blocks of this matrix. Uh, so the entries are actually n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. So this means those two guys 
in the limit, considered as matrices for themselves, will converge to free semisolid class. Okay, but the question is what do we have here? Huh? I mean, here we also have, of course, complex, we have Gaussian random matrices, but we don't have the symmetry condition. Huh? I mean, this A is a symmetric one, which means, of course, this block and this block must be symmetric for itself, but the symmetry for this block means that this block is the adjoint of this block. Huh? So this block itself has no symmetry. But apart from this, it's also like a complex version of the GUV. And this is really the guy which we should understand a little bit better, and this will then be the circular. Yeah. Good. Okay, so the N goes to infinity. I mean that is A goes to a semicircle, but on the other side, I mean we can also write as a two by two matrix where we also see what happens to the edges, at least for the diagonal ones. We should understand what happens for the other one. Okay, and so maybe, maybe let me give names to this, so let me write this. Uh, the four blocks which I have there, let me call them A11, A12, A21, and A22. And they here, this is itself a Gaussian unitary matrix, uh, but of course, the 1 over n scaling is not the correct one because this is only n over 2 by n over 2. So there's a difference of the factor uh, square root of two. Uh, so, okay. uh, so I mean one over n over two square root goes into this, but then I have additional. Uh, but anyhow, so I write it like this, and the a one one and the a two two. Of course, I can control it a little bit very easily. Well, you know this by the sides. So a one one and a two two converge. To three semicircles. Three circulars, let's call them S1 and S2. Uh, but what about the uh, off time elements? Uh, okay, so this is not a GUE, but it's a kind of a complex, non standard joint version of this. And the symmetry, of course, is this is the adjoint of this. Okay, but then of course we can again control what happens 
if n goes to infinity, because I mean now we have again two independent GUEs and they converge to free series of class. So this means this guy here converges to something uh, which has as real and imaginary part two semicircles which are free. Okay, and that's something which we call a circular. Of course, this is the analog of, of what happens in the classical world. If I have a complex Gaussian, this is something uh, where the real part and the imaginary part are real Gaussians which are dependent. Oh, so here we have a circular guide, a circular. So a circular element is the analog of the complex Gaussian. Oh, and the real part, the imaginary part, are free semicirculars. Corresponding to the fact that the real and ima imaginary part of the complex Gaussian are two independent real Gaussians. Of course, this is of course the reason that, that we get this thing. Classical entries. Good, okay, so we know that D1 and D2 converge to uh, free semicirculars, let me call it as an S twiddle, uh, we already used S1 and S2 before, and actually we also see that the entries here are independent from the entries here and from the entries here, so the semicirculars which we get here are in the limit also free from the ones which we get here. Um, so, yeah, so we converge to to semicirculars um, for infinity, where S and S twiddle. Thank you. 
can uh, write a semicircle actually as okay, we have this one on one square root of two, and then we have a two by two matrix where we have s1, s2 on a diagonal two three semicircles, and here I have a c and c star, uh, where the c is also free from this stuff. <coughs> A semicircular C is circular and S1, S2, and C master. Okay, so this means we have shown somehow a nice way of realizing a semicircle by 2 by 2 meters. And maybe I'll write this down as a Theorem also made to make this here uh, more precise. Because we are saying by taking this information here that I get an element which is a semicircle, no? so which has a semicircle distribution. Let me form it as a theorem because this is an important ingredient in what we are going to do for phenomena for us. So let us start with this data. And I have star free semicircular and circular elements. So this should be star free semicircular or circular elements in some say star probability space. Of course, I mean later. Will be a phenomenon algebra setting, but for, for this, it's still enough to look on the algebraic setting. So, in some star probability space I, also we have those guys are semicircular, this is circular, and they are star free. And then we consider this 2 by 2 matrix, of course, in the star probability space, which is given by 2 by 2 matrix over my underlying uh, probability space A. Then we consider something which we call S, which is given by 1 over the square root of 2, where this 2 by 2 matrix S1, C, C star, S2. We consider this as an element. by 2 by 2 matrices over here. So in space in 2, A, those are 2 by 2 matrices where the entries are coming from A. Of course, this is again a star algebra. And the state which we consider there is, of course, we compose uh, the trace of the 2 by 2 matrices with the state which we have contained. So we take trace n so far. Of course, we have to m by 2, m. 2 by 2 matrix over A can be identified as the ordinary 2 by 2 matrix tensor. Okay, um, this uh, okay the statement is that then this element in this space is a series of Okay, I mean, what I just showed you is, is more or less the proof of this. Uh, okay, why are random matrices? But of course, I mean, you can also prove this directly. I mean, there, here there is no, there are no random matrices here. It's just a statement about elements in some spaces, and we claim uh, an element which is built out of other elements of which you know the star distribution is a single circle. No? So what we have to do is just, we could just check that this guy here has, as the moments, have a of us. And this is a purely combinatorial thing. Okay, you, and one can do this. I mean, with our machinery, Cumulative machinery also, I mean, it's not too hard to do this. No? So, I mean, this is maybe one point which I want to make. The, I mean, the random matrices are important for giving you ideas, but they are not absolutely necessary for doing the proofs. Of course, many things were proved by using random matrices, so I'm, uh, those things go back to Wakulescu, and he proved them by these random matrices, but you can, I mean, if you know what you want to prove, you can also prove it by, by different ways. Huh? For example, with the analytic machinery. And one of the 
nice things in free mobility theory is that we have uh, different ways of modeling or, uh, or realizing things. And so, I mean, some ways give you maybe a better idea what, what is true, what, what, uh, yeah, what, what you want to formulate as a theorem, but maybe some other ways are better for proving it. No? So you can switch between different points of views. And essentially, I think there are maybe, maybe three ways of, of dealing with operators. No? I mean, uh, so if we, have a, if we have operators, we have some freeness around, then of course we have the combinatorial machinery. No? Okay, so I mean, we can just use, maybe calculate moments by using the moment cumulative formulas, non cross competitions, and so on. No? But here, I mean, what, what random matrices tell us, we can also model our operators by, by random matrices. And then, for example, like this, this might give you a good idea what properties you have for those operators. And another way is maybe that you can also model your distributions by operators on full Fox space. So I didn't talk too much about this in class, but in some of the assignments we looked on, on the on Fox space, that for example, we also realized the semicircle as the sum of creation and annihilation operator, which is also a very nice uh, realization. You can also use this for modeling a lot of things. Uh, and this, I mean, uh, this sum of creation and relation operators has somehow the combinatorics built in in an implicit way. Uh, so it also you can also deal with all the combinatorics without really writing down formulas involving non crossing partitions because the, the relations between creation and relation operator uh, generate some of the combinatorics in a hidden way. Uh, but all those things in the end, I mean, are equivalent, but I mean, in some cases, some of them are easier to use or maybe give you a better idea. And it's also personal taste, no? but I think the strong point of view of is we have all those different points of view and we can switch between them. Good, okay, but so I mean, uh, yeah, so this is this main theorem. Uh, and now, maybe what I want to do next is to understand this guy here a little bit better. No? Okay. I mean, we will, we will in the following use, and we want, we want to understand the frequency. So the free group factors we know are generated by n, by, by n uh, free semicirculars, and we will realize somehow those semicirculars essentially in such a form. No? Okay. But then to work with them, we have to understand the C beta in particular, we have to understand the polar decomposition of this guy beta. And that's what I want to do in this section here. No? And then we will use it in the next section really for understanding the free group factors. Okay. Semicirculars can understand quite well. The distribution is given very nicely. But circular elements, of course, they are not normal operators. Uh, so their star distribution is, of course, much more complicated in a sense. But on the other, other hand, I mean, we have written it nicely in terms of, of semicirculars, from semicirculars. So the star distribution is, is quite easy. If we go over to real and imaginary part, the star distribution of the circular element is easy to describe actually in terms of cumulants. I mean, semicircular elements have very easy cumulants. So I think the same is also true for circular elements. So easy to describe in terms of cumulus. Okay, since we know I mean the C by definition is S plus I S twiddle divided by square root of two. Okay, as an S twiddle are free semicirculars. And we know the cumulants of S, and we know the cumulants of S twiddle, and we know that uh, mixed cumulants in free guys vanish, so of course we know also the cumulants of C. Okay, so semicirculars. So we have. Also, actually, because for S and S twiddle, we only have cumulants of second order, uh, the same is true for C. Okay, for 
of second order, of course we have now star cumulants, so we, there are actually four cumulants of second order, no? because we can choose the entries uh, for all possibilities between uh, C and C star. So what we have in the non trivial cumulants, so what is the second cumulant of C and C star? Okay, so of course, if you plug this in, we get this term of two divides, so we get one half. And then we get the second cumulant between S and S, between S twiddle and S twiddle, and the mixed terms vanish, because those guys are free. Okay, so what we have here is the second cumulant of S and S, and the second cumulant of S twiddle, and S twiddle, but S twiddle is multiplied by I, so we get I squared, which is minus. We actually get here minus. Well, the second cumulant of S is 1, the second cumulant of S twiddle is also 1, but this goes away. So actually, this cumulant is equal to 0. Okay. More interesting is the second cumulant C C star, where it is actually the same. So again, we just get the cumulants between S and S, and between S and S twiddle, to make one go away. But now, yeah, we have a, a C which goes with the plus i, and we have a C star which goes with the minus i, and plus i times minus i is now plus. So we have now the plus, and now we get 1 plus 1 divided by 2, and now you see that this 1 over square root of 2 is a good normalization, so that this here is equal to 1. Oh, and of course, if I do the other way around, this will be the same, C star C, and of course, if I take here C star, C star, and also the same. Okay, well, so this means that the only non vanishing cumulants are the second cumulant C, C star, or uh, C star, C. Oh, so the other ones are non Very, very nice, uh, but actually, if we are going to work with this, at some point we will need actually not the real and imaginary part for, yeah, of, of this guy, but we, we need the, the polar decomposition. Okay, I mean, this is, this is not so clear for this description. Now, what is the polar decomposition of this guy? Well, if you have a phenomenon algebra and circular elements and okay, can be in a phenomenon algebra, then we know we have a polar, polar decomposition. And actually, polar decomposition is uniquely determined. Huh? And, so the, and also, this, this means that the distribution of the parts in the polar decomposition must be uniquely determined by the distribution of C. Huh? Okay, so there must be a, a definite answer, and that's what we want to understand. Um, so this is not totally true. Huh? So, Tell you what the, what the answer is, and then we are trying to understand this. Yeah, so we need to understand from our applications. Times Q 
of Q, of course, Q is the absolute value of this, and this in general is a partial isometry. Oh, okay. oh, so you can always write it like this, and this is unique. You are also making a requirement of kernel of the U, that's what you want to do. And uh, what we now want to understand, what is the distribution or the joint distribution of U and Q? What can we say about this? Okay, it turns out that actually, so what do we have? I mean, first, first Q is trivial. Huh? I mean, Q is the absolute uh, value of C, and this, this is here what it has to do. I mean, Q, of course, this, so I'm taking uh, C star C, and then the square root of this, and this has a quarter circle distribution. Huh? And C star C has the same distribution as S squared, huh? it's also easy uh, to see, and S squared. And then taking the square root means I'm just taking the absolute value. Of, so from the semicircle, I'm just taking the positive part. I mean, also the negative part becomes the positive part. And we are calling this a quarter circle distribution. Quarter. Star C, this is of course a positive operator, and this has the same distribution as S squared. If you are using this representation, this should be easy to see. And this has the same distribution as the square of semicircle. And then we are taking the square root, the positive square root, the square of semicircle, which means we are just taking the positive. Density, of course, so d mu q of t, you can write this, of course, so this is the density of the semicircle, but restricted to the positive part. And we know the rest, huh? not dividing by 2 pi, but only by pi. Uh, and t, so on the interval from 0 to 2. Uh, the semicircle lives from minus 2 to plus 2, and now if we take the positive part, Absolute, absolute value is just this from 0 to 2. Huh? So this is some, something like this. Huh? So that's the distribution of this part, but this is clear. Huh? I mean, for this, you don't need anything. But the question is what is with the other part? Huh? So, what, first of all, what is the U? In general, this could be a partial isometry, uh, but it turns out here that it is the nicest partial isometry. So first of all, it's unitary, and it's also the nicest unitary, which we have, and then we are unitary. So, this U is a unitary, so this is something which we understand well. Okay, and then the question is, what is the joint distribution between U and Q? And of course, I mean, the only way we can really understand and deal with joint distributions is if the guys are free. And that's also the case here. Huh? So we also have the nicest situation we can think of, namely that U and Q are stuff. And this means, of course, we understand quite well uh, distribution. Um, joint distributions of operators are, of course, usually a very complicated object, a uh, big collection of moments. And usually we say we understand them if those guys are free, because then we can reduce the joint distribution in a conceptual way to the distribution of each of them. Good. Okay, and I mean, the proof of this can now again be done in different ways. An original way of Rapulescu was to use this random matrix uh, realization of the circular guys huh? as this, this non self joint version of the genes. Uh, I mean, this proof also requires a proof. So, the proof of this can be done in different ways. Can be done Random matrices. Oh, and this was done by the last group. And again, I mean, make, getting the idea that this polar decomposition has this nice form comes, of course, also from random matrices. Huh? So if you realize this by the big guys, and then, I mean, if you realize the C, by a non-servant joint GUE matrix, and then essentially you take the polar decomposition 
of such a random matrix and to try to understand what the parts are there and what happens with them if n goes to infinity. Now, then this gives you this idea. Good. Okay, so this can be done, but I don't want to do it in this form, uh, but I want to do it by combinatorics. Machinery, and actually, I want to do it by generalizing the problem to a bigger class of operators, namely that the circuit operator is a special adding operator. Oh, okay, we will do the polar composition in this class. Okay, so this was something which I did with uh, Anunika, and actually we introduced essentially the adding operators for. I mean, for, for, for getting a, a generalization of this result uh, of what we Okay, and maybe I mean, maybe I should also see, I mean, in order to prove this polar decomposition result, I mean, what we want to show is if C is a circular operator, and then for the polar decomposition, we have that U and Q have this and this uh, distribution. But to prove this, actually, it's enough to do the other way around. Namely, start with U and Q, which have this and this distribution, and then show that U times Q is a circular element. And this relies on the fact that uh, polar decomposition is, is unique. Uh, so if you essentially re if you present a guy which, which, which has the properties of the polar decomposition, then you know this must be the polar decomposition. Uh, and because the polar decomposition uh, is determined within the phenomenon algebra, you also know that the star distribution is unique. Oh, okay, so if you find a polar decomposition with some given star distribution which produces you a circular, you know this must be the, the polar decomposition of the, this must be the star distribution of the polar decomposition. Good, okay, so that, that's what we want to understand. Huh? So we are not going the way that we do a polar decomposition or something, but we go the other way and we multiply u and q and then we want to see that we get what we want to have. Um, good. Okay, but so I mean what what we want, yeah, what, what the important thing is, essentially, that we have here operators, the C and the U have some similarity, namely they have the same pattern of their star kilograms. Oh, and that's what the R diagonal operators, uh, yeah, it's the definition. Oh, okay, so the main point, or in this combinatorial approach is that the star distribution of a circular element uh, has a specific pattern and this pattern is maybe I mean there are not there are not many I mean many of the star moments are zero so most of them are zero there are only two which are not zero but among the four which are possible you see essentially what we have here is an alternating pattern in C and C star huh? so the guys which are not zero are alternating in C and C star and that's the crucial point that will be the definition of R diagonality, that we only have uh, non vanishing star cumulants if we have an alternating pattern in A and A star. And actually, I mean, in one of the assignments, we are asked to calculate the star cumulants of a high unitary, and then you should have observed that this also has this property. So this somehow tells us that if we have here this alternating property, for the cumulants, this also goes over to the polar decomposition. Uh, so the U, which shows up here, should also have this property, and this means it's essentially it has to be a high integer. Good, okay, so the main point of the combinatorics, which is behind the whole thing here, is so the star distribution, the main point of the star distribution of C is that it's not zero. Cumulants are alternating in C and C star. Of course, I mean, you only have a small sample of non zero so it's, From this point, it's hard to say whether this is not crucial or not. Huh? But maybe if you see that the same is true for, for high unitary, then maybe this gives you a hint that this might be an interesting class of operators which have this problem. Okay, that's the class which we are calling R operators. And we want to <coughs> investigate this class a little bit better, and in particular, we want to check what their polar decomposition is.
define first the notion of other in the team. And we will do this in the tracial setting. No? So, I mean, of course, here, the cumulant of CC star and C star C are the same because I'm in mean, a tracial setting. And in general, they could be different, but uh, I want to restrict to the tracial setting because that's also a phenomenon that I'm next to one. Good, so here's the definition. And this goes back to work of mine with Andromeda from 1997. Um, okay, so we do it in a, in a star probability space. So, so A5 should be a star probability space, but I said a threshold one, which means the underlying state is a trace, the threshold star probability space. And then we are looking on special random variables with special property, and we call them other. Oh, 
possibly non-vanishing, possibly non-vanishing cumulants are those, and I mean we call it alpha n. No? So alpha n is a sequence of numbers which contains all information about the star distribution of the considered r diagonal uh, operator. Good. Okay, this sequence we call a determinant sequence. So, sequence of variables alphas, the sequence of alpha n, and the natural number is called determinant. So we know at least two examples of r diagonal operators. One of course is the circular operator, and the other one is the unitary. And the unitary you know at least if you do this assignment. So So an example, the first one is the star cumulants of a circular element that we saw. I mean, I mean, there are many things are zero. No? So, I mean, most of those alphas are zero. And the only one which is not zero is alpha one, which corresponds to the second uh, cumulant. And then this is, this is the cumulant of CC star of C star C. No? But there we saw the second order cumulants of CC and C star C star, they are zero. Good. So, by the graph, the circular. Normal. 
But the typical, uh, typical R-dying element is like a C. This is not normal. Also, we do this. So this means I mean the star distribution is really a very complicated uh, collection of moments. So, I mean for normal for normal elements like the high unitary, we can identify the, the moments with a probability measure, the uniform distribution of the circle. And for self-adjoint elements, we can identify the moments also with the moments of the probability measure. For non-normal element, there's no way of doing this. No? So, so I mean if I have a non-normal upper non-normal element, the star distribution is a huge collection of all possible moments in all possible combinations of A and A star and this cannot be identified with the probability measure of C and so it's very hard uh, to get a grasp of this. But I mean if there's some freeness around then uh, again we have a better way of understanding it. And so, so an adiagonal operator is a typical non-normal element but the star distribution is somehow still very special type, uh, but, but it's so somehow of such a type that we can control it. Again, it's just determined by a sequence of numbers, uh, like, like the moments for a servitor guy. Uh, okay, and the rest, the rest of the star distribution we can calculate out of, of these numbers. Okay, so I mean so it's really typically non-normal. Right? Non-normal operators are not so easy to deal with. So it's, it's, it's good to have a, a, have a class, a non-trivial class of non-normal operators where you have at least a chance of doing calculations for various things. Uh, from this point of view, r dying operators are an important class of, of non-normal operators, in particular in the context of free probability theory, because usually you can calculate a lot of things about that. Okay, so... Multiples... Cumulants 
against cumulant of, let's say, A B star, or A B star, and so on, A B star, and so on. Looking now on the random variable A B star, a positive operator. <laughs> this has to be determined somehow in terms of the alpha, but the formula for this is exactly how about my cumulant formula. Huh? So, namely, I'm summing it here over the ground crossing partitions of N. And then I take here the multiplicative function given by the alphas. Oh, so this alpha pi here, this is our usual notation. Oh, so this is a multi multiplicative function. We have been multiplied the alphas according to the loss function. So this is corresponding to the sequence of numbers to these alpha n's. Oh, so this is alpha pi. Given by taking a product over the blocks of pi, and for each block I take the alpha, and where the index is just the size of the block. So alpha the size of the block. Well, that's our usual multiplicative extension of, of functions, or we also, also have our linear functions. Huh? Okay. So if I have a sequence of numbers, I can define this multiplicative function. And of course, the distribution of a a star. Distribution of A star A is the same. So this is also the same in our tracing setting as the cumulants of A star A, A star A, and so on. Good. Okay, but this tells us that, I mean, those cumulants here, which determine, of course, the distribution of A A star, are given by a more equivalent formula in terms of these alternating cumulants of the alphas. And of course, by Möbius inversion, this means uh, that the alphas are determined by the distribution of A A star. No? So the alphas, in a priori, are determined by the star distribution of A. But this here tells, tells us that the only thing which I have to know is the distribution of A A star, no? which is the cell joint. So this distribution is a probability measure on R plus. No? Okay, and these alphas are determined by this. And the knowledge that I have now, like, of course. So this is maybe. The most important conclusion of this was important to us that by Möbius inversion, just solving this equation in terms of the alphas, uh, and by Möbius inversion, the alpha n, and thus the whole star distribution. Star. 
Good, but I'm, of course, not summing over all sigma, but only over those which respect somehow the multiplication pattern here. And this was this condition that is true between sigma and this zero hat n, uh, which was yeah, which was the partition which told us what we have multiplied here, that this has to be one to n. Right? I mean, this, this guy here is just given by the blocks of the position which are multiplied, and here of course I multiply the first and the second element, the third is the fourth, and so on. Also, this is just a pairing which pairs uh, consecutive elements. Uh, Good. And so we have to see, I mean, now we have to understand what this here really means. Right? And of course, this here will factorize into a product of cumulative A and A star. And of course, we know it's only the alternating ones we can show up there. Uh, but I mean, a priori might not be so clear what what we really have here. And so, and then maybe what we have to do is we have to look on the situation A, A star, A, A star, A, A star, A, A star. Okay. We have to choose a uh, partition sigma which connects those guys. And in the end, everything should be connected. But in this book, this, this here tells us that those guys are already connected. And the sigma must now make the connection between the other guys. Good. Okay. But now, of course, we know, I mean, what we have, uh, the only cumulants which are different from zero are the alternating ones. No? So this means this A star here must be connected with an A. No? Okay. But which A can this be? I mean, this can only be the next one. Because if, if it would not be connected to this, but let's say for this one, then you see that actually we have no chance of connecting this guy here to the rest. Huh? And if this here goes to an A, the A is always the first here. Then what is in between cannot be connected uh, to the rest. Huh? So this means this guy here must be connected to this. Of course it can be connected to more, but at least it must be connected to this. In the same way, this must be connected to this. This must be connected to this, and this must be connected to this, and then also this must be connected to this. So that's the minimal condition which we need uh, to satisfy this requirement and also taking in, in, into account that we must connect in an alternating way. Okay. And the star must be connected with A. Okay, now, but now if I have this minimal pattern, then actually the, the connectedness condition is satisfied. I can't forget about this, that I'm just left with now making more connections between them. But now you see what I have. Essentially, I have now those guys they are now guys which are connected. I cannot do anything with them anymore. And now I'm just left with making non-crossing connections between those, those guys. No? But I mean, those are now endpoints. So I'm doing a non-crossing partition of endpoints. And the corresponding cumulant, which I get for this, will be, of course, an alternating one, alpha star, uh, a star a, a star a, and so. And the contribution from this sigma here will be exactly the distribution there. Oh, okay, so let me try to write this down a bit. So note that A star must be connected. Okay, 
So this means uh, um, the, the sigma, which contributes here, must at least have those connections. Sigma connects this with this, then the kappa sigma is of course uh, a star a, a star a, two like this. But this of course is exactly alpha 2, uh, which is uh, which, which corresponds that pi has, has a block of size 2 which connects this with this. Okay, so this is this one. So this is one important point. I mean, you know, I mean of course, just saying that the distribution of a A star is determined by the star distribution of the A's, that's true. No, but we say it's determined in a very precise way, in a very nice way, and actually you can also go the other way. Namely, the star distribution of A is determined by the distribution of A A star. That's, of course, generally not the case. But if we have other identity, this is the case. Good, and now the, the other main theorem. Okay, so, so this tells us that if we have two other elements, we can decide whether they are the same or not by looking on the distribution of A star. Good. Now the other main theorem in our context is what happens if I multiply an other element with something else? Right? That's going into the direction of our polar decomposition. Because there we want to see what happens if I multiply a high unitary with something else, which is free. Right? And there we have a general statement that 
if I have pressure start on the T space and I have two elements there, let's say A and B, and, a, and assume they are star free. And then the claim is if one of them is diagonal and the other can be anything it wants, then the product is also diagonal. Okay, and so maybe let us look 
on the pi, yeah, the block of pi which contains this a. Yeah? There is one block of pi which contains this a, and so what situations can we have? Um, yeah, of course, yeah, we know the a and the b are star free, so this means I mean the pi can only connect a and a stars and b and b stars. Yeah? Okay, and the a must connect what for B, there is no constraint. Um, okay, so we consider this block, and this block here, this can be either the first element, uh, yeah, this A can be the first element in this block. Huh? Okay, so, so this means this must connect to this side. First means if I'm looking from, from this direction. Um, yeah, so consider. In this, this, this is the second of the A's uh, in this situation here. Uh, in the arrow there, we indicate the position. Uh, okay, for this I have two possibilities. Either it's the first A in this block, or, or it's not the first one. And let us look on both of them. So this is either the first. Situation then. No? So I mean, we have, let's see, we have here AB, AB, this is the A I'm looking at, this is the first element, so this must be this direction, must be connected, it must be connected to A star. No? The next thing coming here must be A star. Okay, the A star, this shows up in the adjoint of the B. No? No? So this means the B is, is on this side. No? Of course, I have the here. Yeah, but then, um, okay, no, I don't want, I don't want the, the next one, I want actually the last guy in this book. Hmm? Okay, yeah, so, so this is really, I mean, A, this must be alternating, if it starts with an A, it must end with an A star. And the next one also is an A star, but let, let, let us look at the last one. No? So there might be more connections here in between, but the last guy is here, this one. Okay, and then you see that this block here, I mean, this encloses now everything which I have here, and this cannot be connected to this guy anymore. No? The other guys without having crossings cannot be connected to this. No? So this means uh, this here is not, not possible, hmm? because otherwise I cannot satisfy this condition. Okay, huh? so, so this here is the last. Star, B star, 
Yeah. And now we see the same kind of problem. This is connected to this. And I mean, there's no way of connecting the yeah, outside and inside. Right? Because there's no other connection here. And so again, what I have in between here cannot be connected to the outside. In particular, not, uh, yeah, not, not to this one. Yeah. But there is something inside. It's AB. It's not empty inside. So this means this is also not possible. I can also be not satisfied <laughs> this condition here. That everything is connected. You are only allowed to use alternating connections in the other side. Also in both situations. Conditions. Condition. That pi and this zero and n together must connect everything uh, to not satisfy. satisfies this condition, the contribution of kappa pi is equal to zero. Uh, because uh, we have to have all non alternating formula in the game. <coughs> Hence, there is no contributing pi. Okay, this means, of course, okay, that this whole sum is zero. So this means that kappa n of such a non alternating situation can be If you like, you can do the same if you have a B star, A star, B star, A star, A star. Okay. And of course, I mean, it could also be a simple way. I mean, that, that one A, B is at the end, one the other is at the beginning, but of course, the arguments are all in a simple way, because you can do the same kind of argument. Good. Okay, so that's this. Yeah, so we have now two, the two main theorems, let's say, about other elements, also namely that, uh, uh, that they are determined by the distribution of A star A, and that if they are not changing the other identity, if I am multiplying them with something which is free. And this is not really enough for the polar decomposition, because what we want to show, or to see, is what is the polar decomposition of an other element, and the claim is that it's like in the in the circular case, it's actually very nice, namely <laughs> the polar part is always a high unitary and the two parts are free. And to prove this, you just have to check if I take a high unitary and I multiply it with something which is free, then I get exactly, then, then I you know I get an R element by this theorem. So this means I only have to adjust uh, the absolute value, but this I can do by choosing a distribution of the square of the value. Yeah, so let me, let me write out a statement. Maybe the next time I say a few words about the proof, but in principle it's, it's everything is there. Right? You, can, you can do it by yourself. So let M be a Feynman algebra. And tau, a faithful normal trace. I want to consider this a trace. And then we consider an other element, well, for example, a circular object. But it could also be any other element. So A in M. Of course, with respect to this tau, no? the other angle is something for a star distribution, but of course we have here, so it's tau. Um, and, okay, I, need, I have to be careful that I have to make my product composition unique. No? Okay, so I have to assume something for the kernel, and if I, I multiply something with a high unitary, and then something, then I'm not getting a kernel. 
No? So I can only get uh, elements here which don't have a kernel. Right? The kernel is so I should assume this. Uh, but otherwise, the kernel composition is more complicated. And assume that the kernel of A is just zero, which is, for example, the case for certain values. Okay, then I'm claiming then the polar decomposition of my product A, polar decomposition A, oh, this is always of the form u times q. Uh, but now I can say something very specific about the star distribution of u and q. So this A has the following uh, star distribution. First of all, um, the U is really a high unitary. Oh, okay, so the R diagonal operators all have the polar part as a high unitary. Of course, Q, I mean, Q is of course just the distribution of A star A, the square of this. Oh, I mean, this, is, this is key. I mean, that, that's. That's now essentially the freedom which we have to choose the specific R diagonal element. Well, I mean, you see the polar decomposition. I'm saying this is a high unitary, those guys are free, and then the freedom I have is to choose a distribution for this. So Q, well, this is clear which we choose the R diagonal So this is a positive operator. Then distribution. Is of course the square root of a star. Right? It's the absolute value of a. That, that's what it has to be. The okay, so two is trivial. Um, one is a crucial thing, and maybe even more interesting is that a and q actually are free. A and q are star. Okay, yeah, so the two, two components, the polar decomposition again, have this very nice uh, freeness. Okay, and for proving this, I mean, as I said before, we, we can go back. So because, I mean, uh, the polar decomposition is unique if you have a kernel. Uh, so I just have to show the other way around. If I take elements which have this property and then I multiply them together, then I want to see that I get this R diagonal. Okay. But here, if I have a high unitary, which is R diagonal, and multiply, multiply it with something which is free, so I get an R diagonal operator, and then I just have to check whether it's the one which I want, if the distribution of uh, the absolute value of this guy and the absolute value of this guy is the same, but of course I have chosen the absolute value of this guy, that it is exactly this. No? Because I mean, in the polar decomposition, one component is just the absolute value. You know, I'm just choosing this in the right way, of course I get the other diagonal element which I want. And that, that's absolutely false. Well. So I think this is more or less clear. I don't think that I have to come back to this next time and maybe you can fill in the details, but it's, it's really essentially just this. Huh? This is crucial observation that for the polar decomposition, it's really you can go the other way around. If I present you the polar decomposition, then that must be polar decomposition. Okay, so it's really just about determining uh, what happens if I, if I multiply those guys, can I get R diagonal elements? Also, you see, R diagonal elements are really elements which have this very nice polar decomposition. And in particular, this implies two circular elements. Well, and then we get in back a circular operator has a polar decomposition. We have a high unitary which is free from the absolute value, and the absolute value in this case, of course, is the series of. Good. Okay, so I think <clears throat> that then finishes this chapter. And then next time, next week, we are coming back to the question of trying to use this uh, information and also the idea of representing, let's say, semicircular elements as two by two matrices uh, to use this for getting uh, information about uh, compression of frequent vectors, which gives us some some interesting uh, information. Good. Okay, so see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.